Professor Steinhorn, thanks so much for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Why don't we start off with uh, your background? Where'd you start off, the arc of your career, and what you're doing now? So my background, it's very varied. Um, I've worked on Capitol Hill. I was a speechwriter and press secretary for members of Congress. I've worked in political campaigns. Um, I have worked in advocacy. Um, and I've been a professor after that first phase of my career since 1995. Uh, it's in the communications field, but my blend is recent American history uh, and political communication. But when people ask me what I teach, I often say I teach culture because you can't understand politics and communication without understanding the cultural attitudes and values and norms that people hold and how they express them. So uh, my background really is speechwriter, advocate, um, analyst, uh, professor, historian, communicator. I'm also the CBS News on radio political analyst. So each day I drink in a fire hose of information and news and uh, help them help the audiences make a sense of all of this stuff through analysis and, and commentary and observation and on air uh, evaluation of what's going on, for example, with the January 6th uh, committee, um, as well as constantly talking with affiliate stations around the country, uh, which is really sort of my way of connecting with the grassroots and hearing what people have to say and having those conversations with them. So it's nice to be able to have your finger on the pulse of the country throughout the country and not just in the immediate area where I live or in the immediate profession that I'm in. And that's one of the joys I have in doing radio. So what, what brought you into this area to begin with? Was it a specific interest in you know, being a speechwriter in Congress or was it generally this, did you have culture in mind as your long game from the beginning? You know, what brought you here and what are your broad, it's broad strokes, what are your interest areas? That's a good question. I think growing up in the 1960s um, was important because everything revolved around politics, whether it was civil rights, whether it was the student movement, whether it was the Vietnam War, whether it was Watergate, whether it was Earth Day and the emergence of the environmental movement, whether it was the women's movement and the growth of that. Um, so being part of that culture, growing up, internalizing it, seeing it, seeing the dynamic relationship between politics and social movements and cultural attitudes and social change and institutional change, um, that's really what got me into it. So when I went to college, I sort of began to study history because that's the one way to be able to understand all of those things together and to be able to knit that fabric in a way that tells a story about America and the culture that we're in and who we are as a people. Um, and I you know, sort of did that for a while and taught for a while and then got involved in politics and human rights and civil rights and in speech writing. So working on the Hill helped me understand that, but I was always somebody who uh, did it less so as sort of, you got to win or you lose, but I'm sort of more analytical, somebody who wanted to understand the political context within which we are all in. And so that's why academia became a natural home for me because it's allowed me to write, to speak, to, uh, to author books, um, and to have conversations like these. Um, but really, you know, you can't uproot somebody from where they grew up and how they grew up. And in this particular case, when you grow up in the 60s and your eyes are open to everything and you see the world changing around you and you see the resistance to change and you see politics and society and culture and economics and foreign policy all blending together, um, you know, you become somebody who, who gets interested in what we in the historical profession calls cultural history, because that blends all of those things together to be able to understand the larger um, portrait of the country that you're trying to study and understand. So talk a little bit about your experience as a speech writer. I think that's a very interesting, you know, starting point for your career on the Hill. Um, and, you know, can you talk us through kind of what was that job, you know, how, what was your process in speech writing and what kind of things did you have to keep in mind as you're communicating to these different constituencies, you know, for the members? Well, the funny thing about speech writing uh, for a member of Congress is that you do your best to channel their voice. And so the first thing that you have to be able to understand is who they are and what type of psychology they bring to giving a speech into politics. So you could have people with generally the same political beliefs and ideology, but they'll give two different speeches because some are more psychologically cautious and some are willing to light the match and you know, burn down the barn. Um, so you have to understand the voice of the person um, who, who is delivering those words. 
But you have to understand that often without a lot of contact with them, because a lot of speechwriters don't always sit in the room with those members of Congress or the senators or even the presidents. Uh, you have to know who they are, come up with something and hope that that matches what they want to be able to articulate. And for the most part, you do your best to get it right. And sometimes you don't, depending on their own background and who they are and how they grew up. And sometimes you don't always know about all of that. Um, but that being said, um, the beauty of speech writing is it blends every single aspect of political communication together. So you want to know the research and what people are you know, reporting from the surveys and the polls and the focus groups and the conversations with the constituents. You want to be able to hear that. You want to stay on top of that. You pay close attention to the to the what you, we used to have on the Hill, the mail coming in. Or right now it could be social media. You do your social listening um, or emails or anything like that. So you got to be able to blend the research and out of that, you begin to think about the messaging. And the messaging is not just isolated to the member of Congress, her or himself, but it really has to sort of fit into the larger fabric of the political party or the larger ideology that they represent. But you're thinking about messaging uh, based on some of this research you're doing and the psychology of the person for whom you're writing. And then uh, on top of that, you're thinking about the audience you need to be able to reach. Because as we say in communication, all communication is audience driven. Um, and so who are those constituents you need to be able to reach? What goal do you have in communicating with those constituents? If you're a Democrat, you're not necessarily going to go into some ruby red part of your congressional district or state, even though that would be ideal to be able to speak with everyone because they're not going to vote for you anyway. Or if you go in there, only a small number may say, hey, that person's not so bad, I may consider voting for them. So you have to be able to think very strategically about who your audiences are, what you need to reach them with, how you're communicating with them, and how, how ultimately that might motivate them to continue voting for you, or to support you, or to you know, support a particular policy that you want, or for you to be able to support a policy that they're advocating because that's important for them. So you're thinking very strategically all the time. You're thinking strategically about your audience, the message you're communicating to them, how you're communicating it to them in a way that meets their needs, but is also consistent with the politician for whom you're writing. And you put all of that stuff together and that's what really political communication is all about. So did you have a, a strategy session sort of at the beginning of each uh, Congress and say, here are the constituencies within our district and here are the messages we want each one to have. And then you had that as kind of your backdrop uh, when you were speech, when you were writing the speeches, or is that something that was just sort of un, unsaid and known between the group? Yeah, it's unsaid and known between the group. I mean, you sort of have to go in there knowing your member of Congress, knowing their congressional district or their state, um, knowing everything about it, and seeking out the advice of some of the political advisors. And as I say, the pollsters or the press people who are constantly reading and figuring out what's being said in, in particular communities. So you're really drawing on a lot of information. Plus, you're drawing on experts because many of those speeches are built on topics. They're not just you know, blatantly political or campaign speeches. They're built, built around topics and issues that are of importance to constituencies. So you then have to not only understand what the constituencies are saying, but what some of the experts on staff are saying or in particular committees are saying to be able to help you out on this. Um, so when I was speechwriter for um, the legendary member of Congress, Peter Rodino, um, and I was a speechwriter and I was on the House Judiciary Committee, I was constantly working with uh, congressional staff, whether it was on gun issues or immigration issues or or antitrust issues, they had to be able to help me understand and put into good under, you know, accessible language for people, the, you know, how they were dealing with some of these very complex issues on Capitol Hill. I like to joke that on the House Judiciary Committee, I was the only non-lawyer on the professional staff. And trust me, I probably needed to uh, you know, go through therapy after that for a while, because they all had their particular way of seeing and doing things, which was to worry about um, liability, worry about, um, uh, you know, dotting all the I's and crossing on the T's, because that's how lawyers think. So you have to be able to take that, channel it, and transform it into language that the general public can understand, or particular constituencies can, and that's one of the challenges that a speechwriter faces. 
So if we talk about when you did a speech and, and thinking about what the outcomes of that speech would be, you know, you mentioned them earlier, you know, will they vote for me? Will they uh, look at me in a positive way? Or is it focused on the swing voters, you know, or is it, you know, signaling something on a particular issue? You know, how deliberate would you be on those outcomes uh, and making sure that either it was tailored to those outcomes or ultimately could you measure whether you influence those outcomes at all through some third party afterwards? It's hard to measure all of that, you know, from a single speech. Um, so much of communication is cumulative. So, you know, as we know, in any form of communication, whether it's advertising or politics, you have to be able to keep reinforcing the message so that it, you know, sort of gets through the clutter and the drizzle that people are facing every day to be able to reach them. You know, advertisers used to say a person needs to see an ad three or four times before they, you know, actually are aware of the product you're trying to sell. And it's probably far more than three or four times right now, given um, all of the distractions that we face and all of the media that we consume on a regular daily basis. Um, so I think part of what you want to be able to do is to create a speech that is memorable enough um, to be able for people to remember it. There's that old speech writing joke that, you know, or statement that you um, tell them what you're going to say, you say it and tell them what you just said. Uh, and what you really want to be able to do is not make a speech too complex, to be able to have people walk away with it, sort of thinking a certain way or telling themselves a story as to why this issue is important or why this politician makes sense. Um, and ultimately, when you're able to do that, um, you add to the sort of cumulative process of hopefully reaching the results that you want to be able to get. Obviously, if you're speaking to a particular interest group, let's say it's to a labor union, you want them to know that you are on their side. You want them to know that you care about the issues that they care about. So if it's a labor union, you're doing one thing. Or if it's a chamber of commerce, you're doing another thing. Um, so you want to be able to focus on those issues. So in that sense, what you're doing is you're signaling to them that you're on their side, that you understand them, that you listen to them, that you hear them, um, and that you're able to do something about it. Um, good speechwriters will always try to end a speech if they begin it telling a story to illuminate a problem and then they walk people through the problem, they want to be able to then provide a solution and sort of end a speech in a rousing way to be able to make people feel that something can be done about it and there are action steps we can all take. Um, so you want to be able to use a speech to be able to bring people into the political process. But it's not sort of a one and done type of situation. It's part of the cumulative communication that you have because one speech only gets you so far. Um, then you have to reinforce it with all forms of other media, whether it's social media or earned media or conversations on local TV or uh, newspapers or online or, or any of those vehicles that you may, may use. So it's part of the cumulative process, but it does have all of those aspects of political communication communication poured into it. So let's talk a little bit about your book you wrote, um, the Congress at Crossroads, uh, where you, I, I think you, you mentioned you interviewed a number of uh, members and others, you know, in, in thinking about where the institution was. Can you talk about what that is? What kind of questions were you trying to answer when you went out, went after that project and what the result was? Well, so Congress at Crossroads, written for the uh, former members of Congress, United States Association of Former Members of Congress, we interviewed 30 plus uh, members who uh, were leaving Congress after, the, you know, in, in 2019 or right before that. Um, either they lost in a primary or they lost in the election or they just retired or they resigned for whatever reason um, may have been. Um, and we wanted really to speak with them about the institution and about how it works and how to make it better as best as possible. So many of them, you know, unlike current members who are always constantly looking over their shoulders and wondering if they say something it's going to be sort of held against them, you know, the, the candor um, and straightforward communication in those conversations was very, very revealing. People felt free to be able to talk about things in a way that they might not have been able to talk about them as sitting members of Congress. So I think that was very illuminating, very helpful, very interesting. Um, and we ended up with some really good conversations, anywhere from, you know, 45 minutes to sometimes two hours. Um, and so, uh, you know, and, and the other thing we gave them was anonymity. Um, which is we're not going to include your names in here. So say what you want uh, and you know, say it as powerfully as you want. 
The sad conclusion of that is uh, we have a dysfunctional institution um, and it's a dysfunctional institution in a lot of ways um, uh, that's sort of crippling Congress's ability to get things done. They did say that, you know, people only sometimes see the headlines and only sometimes hear the way that the media are framing a story of dysfunction in Congress. And they say, yeah, we get a lot of things done. There's bipartisanship on a lot of issues, but they tend to be low hanging fruit issues that don't necessarily address uh, some of the larger, you know, uh, sort of issues that we have to confront as a country, you know, whether it's uh, global warming or immigration or inequality or even race relations, you know, we, Congress doesn't do a good job on those larger issues, but those are the larger issues that in many ways are dividing Americans and pulling Americans apart. So, you know, they can get together and deal with some of the more basic issues, um, but not on the big issues themselves. So they did want to reinforce that, yeah, at a certain level, Congress works. At a certain level, there is some bipartisanship. Um, and, you know, they didn't want people to walk away thinking that everyone was sort of a, a spitting vitriol in each other's face at every possible moment. They do get things done. People have certain caucuses where they may have certain issues that, that they work together on, or there may be regional issues that they can work together on and to be able to accomplish some things uh, that leadership will enable them uh, to accomplish. But that being said, um, they said in a larger sense, it's become a dysfunctional institution for a lot of reasons. Um, and if you'd like, I'm happy to detail a lot of those reasons for you because there are internal reasons for it, but there are also external reasons for it. And in some ways, the external reasons are driving some of those internal problems. And you can't understand Congress without understanding some of those external cultural historical reasons as you know one might say you know you can you can't take congress out of the political culture and you can't take the political culture out of congress um and and they're one and the same and you have to be able to understand all of them together and why we're at this point right now where congress isn't working as well as it should be and there's such animosity and ill will that gets projected to the public and that's all the public seems to see is that animosity and ill will so, you know, the dysfunction that you're mentioning, it seems like there's, you mentioned a couple of things. One is animosity uh, as a potential problem in Congress, uh, and the other is not getting things done seems to be a problem in Congress. Are those the two problems that were identified and that you think are, or, and I guess the third is not, not tackling big problems, right? Um, so are those the key problems that were identified or are there just a host and that's just a, a few isolated issues in a stream of others? Well, they are representative of some larger issues um, that are at stake. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some of the political uh, history here um, and what uh, some call landslide counties in America. Um, landslide counties are counties in which um, one presidential candidate received uh, uh, won by a margin of 20% or more um, in that particular county. Um, right now, about 60% of American voters live in a landslide county, okay? about 60%. And if you look at the actual counties themselves, about 80% of our counties are landslide counties. Um, and if you actually ratchet it up to counties where one presidential candidate won by 30% or more, almost half the counties in America are like that. So why is that important? Um, it's important because people have less contact with others from the opposing point of view. The more we sort according to, according to cultural or political or socioeconomic or religious or economic or ethnic or racial reasons, the more we sort, the less contact we have with each other. Therefore, what happens is that when you say you are a representative, you are largely hearing from people who will confirm the biases that you have because those are the only people you need to be able to get elected. And the more landslide counties we have, the more we have people who basically have to play to the more extremes of their party, the ideological extremes, because if you come off as too moderate, you may get primaried. And if you get primaried by somebody who's more ideologically extreme than you are, you might well lose. So there's every incentive to be able to 
have a more sort of ideologically rigid or partisan point of view as a representative. So a lot of the people we spoke to said, yeah, we've got a problem with D plus 20 or R plus 20 congressional districts, because this is the dynamic that's taking place at home. And this is the dynamic that takes place politically. So even if you wanted to work across the aisle, you could get punished for that. There was one example in uh, what, what one former member told us was about a dinner uh, he was having with somebody from the other party. And they had to agree because they didn't want to be caught on this to arrive at different times at the restaurant and sit in a corner where nobody else could see them because they didn't want it to be reported that they were actually having dinner with somebody who is ideologically different from them. So even if a lot of these members come to Congress saying, I'd like to work together and solve our nation's problems, the political dynamic is like more like a centrifuge. It works away from the center rather than toward the center at all. And when you add on top of this, and a number of these members mentioned it, the very aggressive gerrymandering we have, um, you know, in essence, what we have today with aggressive gerrymandering, sophisticated algorithms and computer modeling is that politicians have increasing power to choose their voters versus voters having less power to choose their politicians. Right now, if you look at the 2022 cycle, um, depending on who you speak with, anywhere from only 40 to 55 congressional seats in the House of Representatives are considered competitive. And when you add, and that's because members of Congress gerrymander to create safe seats. And the other form of gerrymandering is to ensure that even states that are very close politically have lopsided representation in Congress. Ohio, which is you know a reddish state, but still close enough politically within six or eight points, um, you know you have uh, three quarters of their members of Congress are Republicans. Okay, so that's not necessarily representing all of the people in Ohio, even though it's representing each of the, the people in the congressional districts, because those congressional districts have been gerrymandered. So these are some of the issues that they talk about because you can't divorce that process of sorting um, of the population and people living in communities of like-minded communities and gerrymandering on top of that, you can't separate that out from some of the dynamics that go on internally in Congress and keep members from actually talking with each other and doing some of the work that they need to be able to do to get things done. So I'll stop for a second and have you follow up on, on that because that's some of the larger external political dynamics that really does represent the sort of profoundly different versions of America that people are living right now. I often say it's the 1950 version of America versus the 2050 version of America. Um, and that becomes reinforced by the different media that people consume and people use. And that's all being reflected in Congress right now. That's what many of them were talking about. And to them, that then bleeds into how the institution works. Well, you know, I think what, what you're mentioning is, you know, the, the classic primary problem where the, the net result of, of what you're saying is that primary voters and primary, um, you know, more diehards have a greater representation in Congress than what should be implied if representation were viewed as a universal. Like if I if I represent everyone in my district or everyone in my state, then I should, you know, then I should be taking everyone's interests, long-term interests into account. If I'm really concerned about the next election, which isn't really my job, right? My job is to represent the, you know, represent um, the constituents. Um, if if I view my job as running for office, then then I need to focus on, on that narrower group and then reflect that view and potentially in Congress if that's my desired outcome. But at the end of the day, what Matt, what you're saying is that, you know, extreme views um, are going to be, or minority views of the hardcore are going to be better represented in Congress than minority views uh, in these, in most districts in that case. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, let's say you have a district that's been gerrymandered for a safe seat um, for somebody and, and it's sort of become a 60, 40, a D, an R or a D plus 20 district or an R or a D plus 30 district, okay? Um, so basically, if it's you, if you represent, if you're Republican and you're 60% of your district is Republican, then in your primary, you only need to win 
31% of your district to be able to be reelected. And if it's a very conservative district and somebody runs 30 second attack ads against you for perhaps being too nuanced in your legislation or working across the aisle or not representing the particular beliefs, beliefs of the people in the community, um, you could lose that primary and ultimately somebody with a more extreme viewpoint gets in place. So it becomes sort of the gerrymandering of that particular district um, and how they create these safe seats, plus the sorting of America into sort of more like-minded community communities that sort of ultimately reinforce the problem that a lot of these former members of Congress were telling us, which is then says they say adds to the real dysfunction in Congress, because layered on top of that is that they all go on to the media. And as we know, the media like to reinforce conflict and controversy. You know, how rare is it is, is it that media actually have conversations with two members of Congress talking about how they work together to solve a problem? They often bring on people who talk about how the other side can't work with you because we're seeing sorting in the media as well and people gravitating to you know, different forms of media within the larger media ecosystem. And on top of that right now is social media. Um, and, you know, members you know, play, use social media to raise their profile and raise money and speak to the base. And the more you speak to the base, the more money you're able to raise and the more your profile gets noticed and the more cable media notices you and brings you on and the more you get in the news if you throw more rhetorical bombs at the other side and say things that are more outrageous. Um, so all of these factors are re self-reinforcing what we're seeing within those communities about you know, what happens in gerrymandered and siloed communities, um, because ultimately it adds to sort of the polarization that we're seeing in our political culture. On top of that are the attack ads. You know, it's really easy to take something out of context and to put it into a 20 or 30 second attack ad. You go to the Facebook ad library and see all of the ads from, let's say, the 2020 campaign and look at what Biden was saying about Trump and Trump was saying about Biden, but even at a lower level on the Senate and the House levels, and you're seeing everybody taking out of context and using uh, desaturation and other visual cues to be able to demonize for somebody on the other side. So, you know, President Obama used to say that we can disagree without being disagreeable. But what's happened is that the disagreeable is overwhelming the disagree, and we are demonizing and increasingly dehumanizing our opponents. You go ask anybody who does political advertising how they do it. And what they do is they desaturate, pull, draw the color out of every single opponent. They capture them in sort of the grimace look that conforms with some of the research they're doing uh, uh, about you know, what people don't like about that particular opponent. And they show it visually. And those visual cues reach people at an emotional level. The whole point of political advertising is basically to create anxiety about your opponent in the voter because the behavioral response to anxiety um, is, uh, is avoidance. And if you create anxiety about the other side in the voter and the behavioral response to anxiety is avoidance, then people will listen less to the other side and to the opponent and what they have to say. And that makes it even harder to be able to reach them and create any sort of connection between the, the politician and the voters they'd like to reach. So this whole political culture bundled together ends up being sort of distilled into a congressional, into a congressional institution um, and adds to the dysfunction that you have at play. And these are issues that are far larger than Congress's ability to deal with them because Congress can't legislate the media. They're not going to legislate social media. They're not going to legislate advocacy groups that often make the perfect the enemy of the good. They're not going to legislate political ads and tell people you can't desaturate somebody else's face um, or create anxiety about your opponent among the voters. They can't do that. But they have to deal with the consequences of that. And that's what all of these former members are basically communicating in those 30 plus conversations we had that ultimately got put into our publication, Congress at a Crossroads. Well, it's interesting, though, it, it, you know, you're talking about the primary system. And I think that's been something a lot of people have talked about. And there's different issues that can, you know, different solutions people put forward, you know, Final Five voting when Catherine Gale was on the program. and. Uh, you know, there's other ways to try to address some of those problems or, or reducing gerrymandering. 
But in the Congress itself, you know, the, the idea that there's this transparency of all the communications between members, right? And that itself creates a kind of feedback loop um, because they're afraid that, uh, you know, they're going to be taken out of context or whatever. I mean, it, what you're saying there would almost argue for less transparency in Congress. You know, we've talked about in committees, um, you know, should there be more privacy? Should there be more space for members to work with each other without uh, without the phones uh, so that they can get actual things done and compromise? You know, is that a position that you think makes sense based on what you said, despite the fact that you're a communicator? Well, it's funny. Um, that's one of the issues that a lot of these former members raised. Um, they did say there needs to be more transparency in a lot of part of politics. Um, even people who um, don't support any limitations on funding generally are fine with gaining more transparency as to who is funding a particular super PAC or member of Congress. Uh, the full disclosure, they're perfectly fine with. Um, they do believe it's important to have as many conversations with the public or hearings or a testimony that the public can hear and use that to create not just the consent of the governed, but what our founders you know, uh, imagine the informed consent of the government. But they also feel that in some particular cases, maybe you need less transparency, the sort of, to, to use an overused phrase, the safe space members of Congress might need to be able to have conversations and to be able to negotiate privately without all of that uh, becoming public. And, you know, the problem with that, of course, is that even if they agree to that, um, somebody can just walk away and decide that they want to tweet something uh, and put it out there if they're frustrated and feel that they have to protect themselves from being seen as not too uh, politically pure or as somebody who's cooperating with the other side, given the culture that we're in. So it's really hard for them to enforce all of those, um, you know, those private conversations because anybody can open up about them at any time. But all of them did say, hey, maybe we need a little less of the sort of immediate reporting and transparency and somebody not tweeting during a he hearing about something. Maybe we need to people to sort of put the parking brake on a little bit and pause a little bit to be able to have those conversations that can ultimately yield some of the results. I mean, you saw some of that just recently during the gun legislation, bipartisan gun legislation, where they did have a lot of internal conversations. And even though some of that leaked out, they did keep pretty much at it and try to maintain as much sort of uh, privacy in those negotiations as they could. So I do think that the members of Congress um, uh, do feel that yes, transparency is a good thing in politics, but not necessarily always when you're trying to negotiate, but they always say, how do you rein in that one member in the working group who may tweet something out and blow it all up? And that becomes a big problem. You can't regulate that. You can't punish them from exercising their free speech or going on the media. Um, but ultimately, they felt it does become a little counterproductive. So I think in an ideal sense, they have that safe space to be able to have those conversations. Um, but they also like a lot of transparency in terms of the business that they do. I would think there's plenty of room for punishment of, of that kind of a tweet, right? You could be excluded from future conversations. You know, you could not get committee assignments. You know, the parties have ways to punish their members and, and the body as a whole can exclude them from deliberations, right? You know, as long as they have the vote, they, they still have uh, the theoretical power. Yeah, I mean, you can potentially do that. You can exclude them if they do that. Um, that may be a problem if they say, hey, uh, you know, I was just supporting our particular group. Hey, I'm supporting gun owners. Gun owners come out and advocate for me and do a full campaign saying that Congress is trying to shut me up. So yes, they may be able to do some of that. I mean, think about Marjorie Taylor Greene, who has been shut out of committees, and yet through her social media, you know, in, in a, a, a fundraising culture in which the small dollar donations are the coin of the realm, you have Marjorie Taylor Greene accumulating enormous amount of money through her social media and through some of the things that she says to be able to get reelected and potentially ultimately through seniority, if the Republicans uh, uh, gain control of Congress down the line, become a chair of a subcommittee 
Um, and how is that going to play out? So yes, you might be able to do that, but there are so many ways for people to go to the grassroots and complain about that and to be able to build their reputations and build their stature um, that uh, it might be a short-term fix, but in the long-term, they have many other ways to be able to play politically without necessarily uh, having to kowtow to what the committee chair or a leader might uh, say. And so what do you think the ultimate result of that, all these, you know, problems of communication are, right? So you have members that are in, I get, they shouldn't necessarily be according to the, the dif different definitions of representation, but let's just say that they're more representative of these extreme views and they're less likely to talk to people across the aisle. What's the ultimate result? Is it less legislation is passed than would otherwise be the case? Uh, or is it that, you know, more extreme legislation passes when one party has a more control? Like, what do you think the net output is in terms difference of legislation is in the output because of these issues? Well, in terms of some of that major legislation, you know, not the low hanging fruits where they can generally agree on things, um, you are seeing less of that addressed. You know, are we seeing climate change and global warming issues addressed. Um, I mean, this is a ticking time bomb for the next generation. And all of those politicians who talk about children and families and next generation, they're ignoring one of the sort of uh, uh, greatest existential crises this, that this next generation has to address. Yes, it was nice to see a bipartisan bill on guns, um, but does that address the larger issue of gun violence? No, it's a it's a step, but it doesn't address the issue. Immigration, we've been sitting for a decade and a half, if not more, uh, dealing with the fact that we haven't been able to come together on some sort of immigration uh, legislation. Um, so, you know, and you also have that one big F word in the Senate, the filibuster. Um, so unless you do have... 60 guaranteed votes, you're not going to be able to get things through uh, the Senate. So already the Senate is structured in a way that almost prevents um, any sort of bipartisan legislation from taking place because of the filibuster. It is a big hill to climb over, and the filibuster has been used much more aggressively in the past 15 years, particularly uh, by you know Mitch McConnell, who has become a master of the rules of the Senate uh, to be able to figure out how to block things from getting through that he doesn't want to get through. Um, so, um, so again, you may end up with some of those low-hanging fruits where they can get things done and generally agree on things, um, but you do have a great deal of gridlock right now in Congress where a lot of those major needs are not getting done. And what's the secondary effect of that? If you run for president and you can't get anything done unless you pass it through a reconciliation bill, which generally deals with budget and tax issues and things like that, um, uh, if you can't get anything done, the other side has a stake in making sure you can't get anything done, because then they can run and say you haven't accomplished anything, you haven't gotten anything done, um, and that you see government doesn't work, you got to be able to throw the bums out and be able to replace them with the other side. So there's actually a political messaging um, strategy built in to sort of the gridlock um, that people can then use to say, hey, they're not accomplishing anything, elect me instead. Um, so I think that becomes part of it because in the long run, what we're seeing is because of the polarization in society, because the other side is perceived as a threat. You're seeing polls right now where, you know, people just don't see somebody else as, you know, an opponent or as somebody they disagree with them. They see him as an enemy. They see him as a threat. There was one study that I saw which said that the level of distrust in this country is as great, if not greater, than the distrust between Israelis and Palestinians. Okay, um, so if you see the other side as a threat, your goal is to make sure that the other side doesn't gain power. And so power becomes the currency of Congress rather than legislation and results. And everything revolves around making sure that your side either keeps or obtains power. So why would you want to work across the aisle with somebody if that means giving that person credit and giving that person a sense of accomplishment that they can go back to their districts and say they did something? Because for the most part, those are going to be the members of Congress who are more moderate or more willing to work across the aisle. And at the same time, if that's the case, they're in congressional districts that are more competitive 
and they become the congressional districts that you might be able to win to be able to gain the majority. So it becomes a sort of self-reinforcing process between the political culture um, and how Congress works that creates the dysfunction and makes power rather than results in accomplishments, um, the currency of American politics as channeled into Congress right now. And that's why we're in a very, very difficult state. And that's why you have to connect it all up to the siloing of America, uh, the sorting of America, uh, and the gerrymandering that's taking place, because ultimately that results in who gets elected and what their priorities are in terms of when they get to Congress. Even if they walk into those marbled halls of Congress saying, I want to get something done, there are not as many incentives to be able to do that um, as we would like them to be as citizens. But getting things done requires like a majority, right? I mean, that's the, the, the fundamental concept uh, at work, right? And so I guess the, the, the question I have is, you know, if, you know, forget about the gerrymandering, forget about the, because it's the same thing in the Senate, right? They represent whole states anyway. Um, you know, is it that the nation is divided so it can't make a decision, right? You can't get a majority on immigration or these other issues. And, and in which case the Congress can't help that because there's, a, there's not a majority to support a bill. Uh, or is it that there's a majority to support a position, but it's not going through because of some of the pathologies you mentioned? Well, there actually, it may be both. Um, in many cases, there may be a majority or enough people to be able to cobble together a majority to get something done and to work on something. Um, and some of those members of Congress may actually want a bill to pass, but they also may vote no on that bill that they want to pass because it becomes too politically risky. Um, and so there you have a dilemma where a majority may want something, but they can't do it. But also keep in mind that um, the structure of our political system is not always there to represent the majority. Um, you know, we ha now have um, uh, th three of the nine Supreme Court justices who were appointed by a president who did not get a majority of Americans um, because of the electoral college system, which is not necessarily a majoritarian system. You have a Senate, which is not necessarily representative of the majority of the country. Um, you could argue that um, the 50 Republicans, and I don't know the exact numbers here, maybe represent only 40% of the population um, versus the 50 Democrats that are in, uh, in the Senate right now, um, representing 60% because California, which has about 40 million people, has the exact same number of senators as Wyoming, which has about 600,000 people. Um, so there are certain non-majoritarian uh, uh, aspects to our political culture that were built into the system, maybe not imagined in this way by the founders, uh, because we didn't have such population extremes back then, um, but, but that are built into the system, arguably, to protect certain states and certain minorities, um, and they're built in. Um, so you don't always have the majority being represented in Congress um, uh, uh, or the majority sentiment being exercised as you may do, let's say in a parliamentary system where you cobble together a majority of parties uh, and based on the votes that you have. And therefore, you know, you don't face a filibuster. You've got everybody in the coalition voting together. They vote on it. They act quickly. They put it in place. For example, you saw what happened um, in Australia, New Zealand, Canada after certain mass shootings. They put certain things in place rather quickly which we can't do here in our country, even if the vast majority of Americans support some of those uh, uh, policies and initiatives. Um, so, uh, and then if they no longer hold the majority in those parliamentary systems, they have to vote again and the government dissolves. Um, we don't have anything like that um, in, our, in our particular system. So we like to think about the majority, but in effect, we don't necessarily have a system where the majority is always being represented. And with gerrymandering, once again, it's worse than that because you could have a state like Pennsylvania, which is tilt slightly baby blue, okay? And in fact, if you look at some of the aggregate numbers of votes last in the middle of last decade for congressional representation, you would see Democrats winning a small majority of votes in the state aggregate but before the state Supreme Court got involved and said, 
the congressional map is not you know, valid, it's not according to our constitution. You had 13 Republicans and five Democrats representing the state of Pennsylvania in, in Congress because the Republicans won the 2010 election and were able to create a vast majority in the state legislatures to be able to determine who goes to Congress. So regardless of what the majority may feel, it's not always represented in Congress. And so therefore you have another conflict going on where you may have an increasingly minoritarian government at the state and national level not representing the majority. Where I worry about that is 10, 20 years down the line when this next generation moves into the mainstream. And if their values remain as they are right now, they are the most sort of liberal or socially liberal generation in our nation's history or the most inclusive generation in our nation's history, living in a political culture that may not fully represent what that majority is feeling. There I worry about conflicts that may take place between what people really feel and what's actually happening in Congress and in the courts. But it sounds like ultimately this result that you're most concerned about is that legislation does not exist or is not supported, or it is supported by the majority, but it's not going, it's not happening. And, and that's the, the net net of what you're saying is um, things aren't getting done that are backed by the majority. And that's the primary problem that you see. Is that right? In part, yes. I mean, from a sort of democracy perspective, um, we live in a diverse country. People have so many different lived experiences. Um, you can't just say somebody is a Democrat and leave it at that. They may be a real liberal or they may be a libertarian or they may be somebody who's a you know, working class Democrat who has you know, more you know, socially conservative issues, but likes you know, health care and other types of uh, government programs. Or you could be a Republican, you could be a religious conservative and a libertarian. And the only reason those libertarians are Republicans is they, they dislike government more than they dislike the religious right. Um, and so, and you could have chamber of commerce types. So we have lots of people in this country with different experiences, values, and norms. So the question is not just how we enact the will of the majority, but one of the aspects that I think is sort of genius about our system, which isn't working, is that it enables people in an ideal sense to be able to cobble together some of the concerns of the minority out of respect for this very diverse country and this vastly different lived experience that people have throughout our, our democracy and to be able to get the greatest good for the greatest number of people. Um, so theoretically, you wanna be able to have the sides listening to each other, uh, hearing each other and building in some of those concerns even if you're the majority, because you really want to be able to say to everybody in your community, I'm hearing you, I may not agree with everything, but I want to be able to put a few things into this legislation that are going to be able to accommodate you and your lived experience and your set of values and all the rest. But what's happened now is that we're in a zero sum game culture, where if, if you know, the other side wins, therefore you lose. Um, and there's no other way around that. And so people who may want to be able to work together are considered traitors if they bring in any aspects from the other side. And then because we have such gerrymandered congressional districts, they could get primaried or they could lose because they're not pure enough in that process. So any effort to be able to listen to that other side, to be able to get as large a consensus as possible gets undermined by the political dynamics of our culture right now. Um, so from my perspective is, yeah, regardless of what I may believe politically or personally or what my values are, um, I realize that lots of people have lots of different lived experiences. I have that in my classrooms. I have people from all different backgrounds and all different perspectives and all different political philosophies. And how do you bring people who are you know, people with goodwill, people who wanna work in good faith together to be able to resolve some of this, to have those conversations and to be able to talk with each other. And so some of what we talked about in Congress at a Crossroads and how to deal with this is to how to sort of bridge some of those gaps and get people to humanize each other a little bit more in Congress so they listen to each other. One of the big problems in Congress right now is that social relationships have declined. Um, people don't see each other after work. 
the schedule is done in a way to make sure that you're there Monday through Thursday, and then you depart DC Thursday night and you're not around. Whereas years ago, people used to be around. They maybe watched their kids play together in soccer. They got together across the aisle or had dinner and things like that. You don't have that. Because if you are seen as somebody who's a creature of Washington, that becomes a line and an attack ad against you that you're not one of us and therefore you lose. So the schedule is designed in a way to be able to separate people and keep those relationships from, uh, from coming together. Um, so how do you begin to change that? And I think that's really the challenge right now is if you are looking institutionally, how do you build some of those bridges so that people feel good enough about humanizing and not dehumanizing and not demonizing the other side and listening to them so that some of those concerns in the community that may not be the majority in that community, but may represent that 40% in the minority in the community ultimately get represented in some of that legislation. And I think at this point right now, what we can ask for and hope for is that Congress find certain ways to be able to enable people to come together and to talk with each other. Case in point, members of Congress who go on congressional delegations, whether they're official CODELs or, um, or other types of delegations overseas, they will often work together afterwards on certain bills because they've had a chance to have conversations with each other, to hear each other, and to realize that somebody who might be ideologically different from them isn't such a bad person. They just come from a different place. Um, I think field hearings are really good on, uh, for congressional committees, um, where you sort of bring people to the you know, chairs district to, have, to hear from people in that community, but you also bring people to the ranking members district to hear from that com uh, uh, community. I think that's good. District visits are good, where you have people from rural Oklahoma talking with people from Tulsa and actually visiting each other's district or rural Oklahoma visiting somebody from Philadelphia and vice versa and talking with people from those districts because we have to break down that dehumanization and demonization that's just creating a caricature of the other side in our culture and realize that, yeah, you can disagree without being disagreeable. People have different lived experiences. I wanna hear from those lived experiences because I need to know about that stuff. We often talk about living in bubbles. Um, everybody's living in a bubble um, and we have to break some of that bubbles and start uh, getting beyond that. And so, you know, this is a, a big problem, you know, particularly if you, if you look at a lot of the party structure and how it seems to have, you know, become stronger over time, at least when it comes to this ideological component, right? So if you have a certain set of values and in, in, in the party represents those values, then any kind of compromise is going to be a loss, right? So that's the fundamental problem they're going to have if if a, if parties get more like religions, right? Uh, so I'm curious about your perspective on this party over time. You know, you've been doing this a while. You you wrote speeches long ago about part, you know, that were partisan. I'm sure in some way. Um, how has that changed? Do you, do you think it's sharper than it was when you started out or is it the same and there just isn't the time or space to get together to, to find a compromise? Well, I think also the parties have changed um, and they've divided regionally. They've uh, divided in terms of where people live, urban, suburban, exurban, rural. Um, and so we are really sorting into separate and distinct uh, communities that are then being represented in Congress. So you look back to the 1960s, which is one of my areas of uh, expertise, and you saw that as many, if not more Republicans supported the Civil Rights Act than did Democrats. Now, why is that? Because a lot of those Democrats were white Southern Democrats who were locked into their old segregationist ways and didn't want to be have any part of opening that up. Um, and so, but then they began to migrate to the Republican Party. Um, and beginning in the 1930s and onward, African Americans migrated to the Democratic Party. And so you began to see demographic shifts that were reflected of different lived experiences and different ideologies taking place. So that's become more hardened into place in a lot of ways. So we shouldn't sort of glorify the old days that people worked across 
the aisle because in many ways um, there were still regional and cultural uh, and economic uh, differences uh, that were baked into the politics back then, regardless of the parties, which is why Jim Crow was able to last so long in our culture and our politics and our society. Um, so, um, so I think though that um, what you're having is people are talking with each other less, the media they're following is reinforcing their viewpoints less. Um, Facebook is built on algorithms that are designed to reinforce what you believe and present you only with the most uh, sort of ideologically consistent uh, perspectives uh, based on what your history is. Um, and so what we're seeing is sort of an algorithmic sorting of our media, as well as a you know cable sorting of our media um, that then confirms people's biases and doesn't have them listening to anybody on the other side. So you have selective exposure of the media, you have the selective perception or motivated reasoning where we seek out only those uh, ideas that confirm our biases, or as uh, Paul Simon once wrote in a song, The Boxer, a man hears what he wants to hear and disregards the rest. Um, and you're seeing that maximized because of the technology, because of the cable, because of the media, because of the sorting, and therefore there's less incentive for people to be able to get together. Now, when I was on the Hill on the Judiciary Committee, I would always go out to lunch with staff members from the other party. Um, and we would talk and we'd have these conversations and we got along and we, we, you know, we may not have agreed on something, but you know, we, we had those you know, lunch times. Um, I'm not so sure that exists much more. And I'm not so sure that you have those cross party uh, interactions. I mean, you know, you're seeing um, all the surveys uh, taking place where you know, in the 60s, um, uh, lots of Americans didn't care whether their child married some, somebody from the other party. Now you see large numbers of Democrats and Republicans saying, yes, I care, I don't want them to marry somebody from the other party. So there's sorting going on at all levels and it's interpersonal, it's institutional, it's political it's, and it's cultural. And that stuff is being played out in Congress. So yeah, it would be nice to be able to create venues like congressional delegations, like field hearings where they have to talk with each other. And they have to have these conversations. And I think one of the best things that Congress could do is to reinforce and incentivize that because right now the incentives are in the opposite direction. So let's move on to the program where we, and I, kind of, I asked the questions that uh, I've asked of all of our guests. So later on, we can compare the answers. And the first one we can dive into more is the concept of representation. We've used that word multiple times uh, and we've dived, in, dived into that a little bit during the discussion, but my question to you is really what you think represent, representation should mean, right? Is it just those primary voters that a member should represent? Is it their party? Is it everyone in the district? Is it everyone who will ever live in the district in the future? You know, in your mind, what should representation mean to those members? Well, again, um, a lot of it has to do with how particular uh, districts, if you're talking about the House, are drawn up. Because um, you can say you represent your community, and if your community is 65% red or 65% blue, then you represent the vast majority of the community. Um, but what would happen if we figured a way out to make not just 40 to 50 of our congressional districts competitive, but, you know, 350 to 400 of our congressional districts and made them competitive. Um, then what would happen is that people would have to listen to the varied perspectives and have to be able to talk across party lines and have to be able to meet with people in different parts of the community that they otherwise don't have any incentives to be able to meet with right now. Um, and so, uh, you know, again, what's that definition of representing? Do you represent the district that you're in or do you try to represent all the people and listen to all the people of the district? But if the district is so skewed, um, then it becomes very difficult for you to pay attention to that side of the district um, that, may not disagree, that may not agree with you on a lot of these issues. Um, so we can speak from a very principled and idealistic level saying that if you represent the people of a district, you represent all the people of a district and therefore you should listen to all of their opinions. 
But structurally, and because of gerrymandering, because the Supreme Court has basically said, given a green light to all forms of partisan gerrymandering, and may give a brighter green light in the years ahead to even more partisan, partisan gerrymandering, um, then what does representation mean? It means representing the vast majority of the people in your district um, that will agree with you. And I think that's unfortunate, and it leads to some of the dysfunction that we're experiencing today. Um, so again, I think there should be an idealistic version of what representation should be, but uh, you know, idealism, uh, you know, sort of has, has, you know, gets mugged, as they say, uh, by gerrymandering and uh, by political power and political needs and by the incentives that are being built into our political system. Um, and therefore, you may not pay much attention to that 40% of your district, which you know is not going to vote for you, because the way for you to stay in Congress is to pay attention to that 60% and what they care about and what they need. And what about your perspective on you know, the notion of uh, whether the representative makes judgments uh, in what they think is the long-term best interest of their constituents or whether they're just reflecting the views, you know, they're a pass-through. Are you a Burkean or are you more of the delegate model? I think it's often both. Um, and I think you have to respect the people who are willing to break a little with their district, but they could pay a political price. Um, you know, you're seeing this in sort of amplified and magnified form right now of the people who felt a need to uh, support a, a, a January 6th committee or to impeach former President Trump paying a political price, even if some of those members are extremely conservative and consistent ideologically with the communities that they represent. Um, so uh, again, members of Congress are constantly calculating how they can think about what's in the best interests as they perceive it of our country in the future versus the political price they might have to pay back home to be able to stay in Congress. Um, and they may argue that if they go too far astray from where their communities are, then, then it doesn't matter how sort of principled they may be, they will not be able to exercise that principle in future Congresses because they won't be able to get elected uh, right now. Um, but I do think that uh, at least theoretically, members need to be able to reflect both. They need to be able to think about what our long-term needs are as well as what the needs of their communities are and figure out how to thread that needle or to use another metaphor, how to walk that tight wire to be able to balance uh, all of that out. And when, in those interviews with uh, you know, the members of Congress we did, a lot of them talked about that and talked about the dilemma of, yeah, I really think this is in the best interest of the country, but I can't go too far because if I do, I may get punished. And that's why some of them talked about uh, members who, um, you know, what do they call it? The, uh, the hope yes, vote no caucus, which is they hope that something gets passed, but they have to vote against it because of political survival. Um, and uh, that creates a real dilemma for a lot of these members in our current political culture. So next question is really about members' time. So we already, you brought this up earlier in talking about how much time they spend in D.C. versus back in the district. You know, there's different proposals, you know, two weeks on, one week off, or three weeks on, one week off. Where do you come down on that in terms of where you think members should spend their time and what allocation across the year and what they should be doing with that time? Well, it's a good question because everybody wants to be able to go back to their district and talk with people and have those conversations with the community. You want to talk with the people who work in a chicken processing plant and people who work in call centers and people who work in factories and people who you know work in white collar offices and you want to talk with parents and teachers and uh, social service providers and business leaders and uh, uh, workers and all the rest. That's how you understand the pulse of your community and hear from the American people to as best as you can represent what they're thinking and what they're saying. But on the other hand, um, if you don't create incentives for members of Congress to have relationships with each other, to hear from each other, to get beyond their particular caucuses, uh, party caucuses, and to listen to the lived experience of other members who are in their communities, 
and whose firefighters or police officers or teachers are saying something different from the ones in your community, um, then we all lose out because then it sort of doesn't fertilize the ground of legislation that we need to be able to represent the greatest good for the greatest number of people. Um, so I do think that Congress needs to find a way to build in into the schedule more time for people to be able to be there on weekends or spend time with each other or uh, have some of those sort of social conversations to be able to break down some of the walls uh, that exist uh, between and among them. Um, so again, insofar as if all of them were forced to be in DC for a certain amount of time with each other, then nobody can sort of run a negative ad about them being a creature of DC if it's communicated to everyone that this is an important priority because that's how you're able to make better legislation that will ultimately redound to your community. So I think part of it is, is um, really uh, uh, finding a way to be able to enable members to spend as much time in their districts as possible, but also build in time to be able to have that social experience with one another um, so that you sort of stop dehumanizing, that you humanize, you stop demonizing to be able to hear what those other members say, because ultimately that might make it into your conversations with your own constituents and then into the legislation that you might ultimately come up with. And if when you were asking earlier about how do you think about the national good versus your own political survival, um, that's one way to be able to sort of at least plant some small seeds of the national good into each member's uh, form of thinking. Um, and it also, uh, you have to be able to make the point that no, they're not creatures of DC just because they're there for a weekend and talking with each other. They're doing this to be able to help each community and make America better uh, and to create legislation that's going to do so. So I do think to some extent, the schedule can be tweaked to encourage more of that interaction. And I think leadership has a responsibility to do that and to be able to communicate as to why that's important. So it sounds like you come down a little bit on more time in DC than current, but keep a good chunk for constituent service. Yes, I mean, because it shouldn't be you check in on Monday afternoon and you check out on Thursday and you don't have any time to have any of those conversations because the rest of your time is sitting at a phone bank and raising money and trying to be able to support yourself or trying to angle for a position on cable news um, or even working with your staff or on particular pieces of legislation that squeezes out any amount of time you might have to talk to other members of Congress. So therefore, you then follow the party line or you follow the media line that you're uh, consuming. Um, and that becomes the own sort of silo that you're in as a member of Congress. But I also think that um, you know, it doesn't always have to be Washington based. As I was mentioning earlier, if you had field hearings um, where the chair of a committee or subcommittee has a hearing in their district, but also in the district of the ranking member, and they do everything they can to communicate that and to amplify that meeting and to get the press into those meetings to be able to have those conversations with people that might actually make a difference. Or as I said earlier, have those types of um, you know, uh, district visits where people from different worldviews and realities are visiting each other's district and having meetings with constituents that they would never imagine because they've got to be able to hear from those folks because even if they're not representing those people, they know that another member that they may want as a co-sponsor represents those people and that's how you build legislation. And the senators can certainly do it. Why can't Senator Wyoming spend time in New York and vice versa, you know, to be able to hear from people and listen to people. So I'm not saying that, um, that sort of social relations are the only secret sauce um, for getting things done, but it certainly is a secret sauce for being able to sort of, um, uh, sort of eliminate or reduce the amount of dehumanization and demonizing that goes on so that people actually listen to the lived experiences of people who may not be in their state or congressional district. And that becomes informative. And then you go back to your state, you go back to your congressional district and say, yeah, I heard this from people living in Manhattan. 
or I heard this from people living in, you know, uh, Hayes, Kansas. Um, and, uh, you know, this is what they have to say. What do you think about that? Is that all reasonable to you? You know, I'm trying to process what they say in terms of the needs of our district and figure that out. So, you know, again, it's not, you know, to use another metaphor, the magic wand, but I think it can certainly help things along to end this incredible polarization that we're living through right now. So next question is really about debate, deliberation, and dialogue. How should that occur? So if they're in DC, right, or they're on these codels, uh, or they're having hearings, you know, what, what's the best way for them to interact with each other? Is it, is it better for them to be in private? Is it better for it to be a public hearing where they're interacting with each other? Should it be, you know, in bars, should it be in restaurants? Should it be, you know, on the floor during regular, you know, regular uh, order? You know, what, where do you come down on how this debate discussion should happen? I mean, it's all, and the, all of the above, um, you know, that's life, you know. I, uh, as a professor, I'm in the classroom doing my thing with my students, but I'm also in office hours with meeting with my students and I'm talking to colleagues and I'm talking to people in the community and I'm, you know, sort of following different media and talking to people in the press and learning from any and all sorts of, uh, of bits of information that I can bring into the mix to, to be able to say that I am an educator um, because uh, my wing spread is, is broad and I try to bring as many things into it as possible. And I do think that's incumbent upon members to be able to branch out beyond their own particular silos and to be able to do something like that. But I also think, and, and this is uh, sort of an interesting uh, issue that some of the former members of Congress talked about, which is the sort of elevation of the closed rule when you have debates in Congress, which is basically eliminating options for amendments to come up and for debate to happen on those amendments. Now, yes, you don't want endless conversation because that could be another way of stalling things and never getting in anything done. But maybe you need to be able to provide the minority with the opportunity to bring certain issues to the floor and have that debated with a certain amount of time and have people voting on it. OK, um, and to be able to have those conversations in, in that form. Uh, so I think they have to figure out uh, how much bandwidth they give people in the other party and the minority to be able to bring up issues on the floor. Now, again, the filibuster squeeze allows the minority in the Senate to be able to eliminate the majority from even bringing up an issue that the majority may like, and that's a big problem in the Senate. And who knows how they're going to be able to deal with that? Because you know, how do you overcome the need for sixty votes unless you have a supermajority in the Senate? Um, but I do think that more conversations at every level is important. I also think you have to give members of Congress some room and some space to be able to negotiate with each other without sort of giving a play by play and color commentary while it's going on. Because, you know, you could be in the third quarter of a basketball game uh, and talking color commentary, but it's how the game ends that matters. Um, and you got to allow them to play all the way through their four quarters to be able to figure out how that game ends. And so you can't make a decision based on what's happening in the third quarter, because if you do, that could throw off everything else in terms of the negotiation. So I do think that to some extent, um, you've got to give them that space to be able to have those conversations. Um, but at the same time, you need to be able to be as transparent in terms of allowing different ideas to come before a committee and to come to before the floor as possible within limits so that ability to be able to offer as many ideas and amendments doesn't become an obstacle to getting things done. So next question is what fundamental institutional improvement would you make to Congress over the next 50 years? And it sounds like you've got a few different big concerns there, uh, which one of them would you prioritize and how would you implement it? Well, again, you can't take Congress out of the political context. So if I could um, wave a magic wand, I would uh, hope that a Supreme Court 50 years from now does not uh, believe that uh, partisan gerrymandering is in the best interests of the American people. Um, and I think if you, limit the partisan gerrymandering rather than allowing it to run amok, which may happen uh, with an upcoming Supreme Court decision. Um, if you limit it, you may actually have more efforts for people to hear from everybody in their particular communities 
uh, to be able to have more of a conversation. I don't know how you get around the filibuster rule, um, because on the one hand, filibuster is a blockade to any type of result in the Senate that the majority wants. On the other hand, um, if you're in the minority party, and that can flip every two or four or six years, um, you don't want the other side running roughshod over things that you believe, which is why the filibuster becomes convenient. So how do you limit its use? How do you restrict the number of times somebody can filibuster something? Um, do you keep it at 60 votes? It always, it's not written into the Constitution. It's a Senate rule. It used to be 67 votes. It was, you know, up until I think the 1970s. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, but it was, so it was 67 and now it's 60 votes. So it has changed and you've been able to change that. And that's important. Um, so I think those are some, uh, some of the things that they have to think about 50 years from now. I also think honestly that all the people of the United States that are citizens should be represented in the House and the Senate. Um, and I think uh, at a minimum, you probably should have the District of Columbia becoming a state with actual congressional representation. Being a District of Columbia resident myself, it's very frustrating to know that I have no voice in Congress, um, essentially no vote, no voice. Um, yet I pay taxes like anybody else. I think that's something that needs to be thought of and potentially Puerto Rico as well is something that should be considered down the line that may or may not happen because of the same partisan reasons that we're talking about. Um, uh, but I do think that to be able to make representation truly universal as best as we can, um, you need to be able to include as many people. And I think voting should not be seen as a privilege and people shouldn't have to jump through hoops to be able to vote. I would love to see election day become a national holiday. Um, and I would love to see ways to be able to facilitate uh, people's ability to vote um, with uh, uh, and uh, not necessarily have blockades to people's ability to vote. Because if we talk about representation and people feel that they can't vote because they don't have the right documentation, um, that's a problem, then certain groups of people are left out from their voting. You think about young people in cities who don't necessarily need driver's licenses because they take mass transportation and they don't have a driver's license and they may not have an adequate uh, photo ID in certain states, they may not be able to vote. So you wanna be able to make sure that as many people are able to vote as possible so that the idea of representation is as broad-based as possible. Um, you know, and, and study that and figure it out and find ways to be able uh, to empower people with a sense that um, politics is something that's important to them and meaningful to them. And if they do vote, their voice is being heard and they are being represented. Um, so I think by, by sort of breaking down the gerrymanders, allowing more, as many people to vote as possible, giving them a stake in the politics, that then sort of gets translated upwards to how the members of Congress and the senators have to interact with their communities and the American people. Um, and so the more they have to listen to the larger grassroots as possible, uh, the more representative they may be. Uh, and uh, I think that will only redound to the benefit of the United States of America. Next question is, uh, what book or article most shaped your thinking with respect to congressional reform, if any? You know, I think um, Bill Bishop's book, The Big Sort, um, was an outstanding book about the siloing of America and how that's created all sorts of ripple effects in terms of gerrymandering and how we shape our congressional districts um, and, and so on. So I think from a recent book in the last 20 years, I think that's been very, very helpful. But I'm also a fan of the of the Federalist Papers and the philosophy behind our government um, and how it was created and sort of the, the sort of genius of the separation of powers um, and the balance of powers and how that came out of the uh, American Revolution and the Declaration of Independence, um, and the distrust of entrenched power. Um, so to me, I, I think there's a great deal of genius in all of that, but I do think that um, people are taking advantage of that right now in a way that's crippling our system. 
So we have to be able to figure out how to um, make sure that we maintain that separation of powers, that nobody can exert too much power over everyone. Again, built into the Bill of Rights, built into the very nature of our constitution, um, but at the same time, find a way to be able to express the will of the greatest number of people to create the greatest uh, possible solutions. Um, and I think this is something we have to think hard about um, uh, in our society and our politics. The last question is really just about your plans. You know, what do you have coming in terms of either writing or research or, you know, what, what you know, looking forward and what areas are you going to focus on and, and uh, you know, what do you have coming? Well, the previous books I've written, uh, one on race relations, one on the baby boom generation. Um, one of them was sort of more the glass is uh, half empty. The other is the glass is half full. Um, I do have this sort of internal belief, whether it's naive or not, um, you know, that follows, you know, Martin Luther King's notion that the um, arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Um, and sometimes you go backwards on that arc and reverse a little, but I do think in the long run um, that we need to be as inclusive as possible as a country um, and to be able to hear from as many people as we can, to be able to knit the frayed fabric, fabric of our society back together again. Um, but um, so I'm thinking and writing, uh, 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 thinking about writing potentially a book that discusses why we got this frayed fabric, fabric um, and how people might have to be able to figure out how to sort of work around it or stitch it back together. Again, um, I do a lot of writing about recent history. I write a lot about the 1960s. I write a lot about how the 1960s has shaped American politics today. I think it's incumbent upon all of us to be able to understand the recent history of America, to figure out how we got to where we are today. I think about generations and generational transformations. Um, that's why I study the 60s. I also think that this next generation um, may, if we survive these next 10 years, um, and if we don't go into some pretty bad places, which is possible, um, I think this next generation is uh, has far more of a consensus in terms of how they see the world. Um, they are the most inclusive and least prejudiced generation in our nation's history. And if they can overcome some of the cultural roadblocks that we're still stumbling over as a society emanating from the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, um, and if they can start to stop looking in the rear view mirror and start looking through the windshield, um, and if they're able to do that and, and uh, take control of society, I have a lot of faith that they may, ab may be able to come to some sort of consensus and better our country. So I'm very interested in this next generation. And that's some of the, what I actually write about as well is how they may play out in our political culture and sort of make it better for us in the long run. Great, well, Professor Steinhorn, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure and thanks. best of luck with the, uh, the future writings. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks so much for including me. A very interesting conversation. And uh, we covered a lot of ground here, didn't we? Yeah, we did. Thank you very much. Thanks.